So hello again, everyone. This is Clint Finney for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web presentation, July the 16th, 2020. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about some of our winter feeding decisions. I know this is a rough time of year to think about winter, but winter is coming. So let's get started. Wanted to put this presentation together just because we're in the thick of time to start thinking about that snow coming, uh, about that cold weather coming, uh, realizing it's only July, but if we're going to make some decisions about what we're going to do this winter, now is the time. We've got about a month here uh, before that drop dead date comes for stockpiling grass or for planting uh, cool season annuals of some kind to be able to graze. But before we get into that, I, I wanted to discuss just a minute. Uh, I, I know some of you are saying there's that Finney again talking about winter feeding. and Why do we spend so much time thinking about five months out of the year versus the other seven months out of the year, which is our green season that we're actually growing and grazing grass. Uh, it's because winter is our, our most expensive time. It's the most expensive time for us to keep a herd of cows or a flock of sheep or any grazing animal ticking. Um, we've got to have stored forage of some kind, whether it's stored on the stump or stored in a bale, to be able to feed those animals through the time of non-production, the non-green season. Uh, and at its core, management intensive grazing was, was brought about to help reduce the overall cost and the largest cost of all is our stored forage cost, our winter feeding cost for most of us. Uh, but as you travel the nation, and I have, um, you, you find that in the most northern climates, they feed hay for five, six, seven months out of the year. You even get into the Gulf Coast and they feed hay for a large amount of time. And so management intensive grazing, when it, in its inception, what was brought about to help reduce that stored forage time, that stored forage cost, and the, the time that we feed stored forages. So that's why we spend so much time um, talking about management intensive grazing and, and our winter feeding strategy and, and where we're where and when and how we're going to feed livestock through the winter. So the biggest reason for this presentation this week, uh, we have hit that July 15th um, time frame. We talked last week about planting warm season annuals. July 15th was the drop dead date for that. So we're moving on down the road to our, our next thing and our, our next kind of cutoff is if we're going to stockpile forages, we want to stop grazing on those forages between July 15th and August 15th. Now, if you go out and read the publications, of course, depending on where they're from, they've got different dates. But in Ohio, most of the publications will say August 1st is kind of our stop grazing date. But if, if we're managing our livestock in a rotation of some sort, that August 1st stop grazing date, really hard date, doesn't work for us. Uh, for most of us, we're rotating around our pastures 30 to 45 days with the current hot and dry climate. I hope most of us are, are putting in like a 45 day rest before we get back to a pasture. So we need a kind of window to be able to hit. So this July 15th date is the day when, when we would stop grazing on some fields and not graze them again until frost or at least until the end of the growing season around November 15th. Uh, and we can continue to graze some pastures and, and up until August 15th, provided we get adequate rainfall or some rainfall, we, we would have some stockpile grass uh, it was a stop grazing date of August 15th. Now, I, I get questions about quality, and, and sure, your quality is going to be better. Your stockpile quality is going to be better when those stop grazing dates are August 1st or closer to August 15th. Our quantity is going to be better the closer that stop grazing date was July 15th. So uh, we kind of have to pick and choose, and, and we just can't stop grazing all of our pastures on the same day because we we just don't have that kind of livestock numbers and don't have the ability. You know, if we were going to mow them for hay and then allow them to stockpile, sure, we might be able to go out and mow them August 1st and let them regrow. Uh, but for most of us, that's not an option either. So we've got to kind of have that window. So let's talk a minute about what can be stockpiled. For the most part, when we're talking about stockpiled forage, we're talking about um, endophyte infected 
Kentucky 31 tall fescue or the native tall fescue that we have out there in our pasture fields in most of eastern Ohio. Most of it's going to be that endophyte infected Kentucky 31 variety of, of fescue. Um, that is the king of all fes or king of all stockpiled grasses. Um, that, that endophyte that's in tall fescue, this is when it really shines because it makes the fescue tough. It makes it withstand the winter it makes it withstand the fall rains and the grazing pressure and all those things and and the animals tend to refuse fescue a little bit in the spring and summer months uh, but come that first frost or the first hard frost uh, animals tend to turn around and and go after tall fescue and, and graze it just fine and the end of fight that we talk about all the time, you know, it, it, it can raise an animal's body temperature. And in the wintertime, that's not such a bad thing. So this is when that, that end of fight infected tall fescue really shines. Uh, we, we, we were taught in college that alfalfa was the queen of the forages. And, and of course, in college, they considered corn to be the king of the forages because it was for corn silage. But for me, tall fescue really is is to me in grazing the king of the forages it, it's productive uh it, it's tough it will last and, and we just have to to work with the end of fight we have to dilute our pastures enough to make sure that they uh have the livestock have other species to graze on along with the tall fescue to help alleviate some of the the detrimental effects that, that end of fight can have on our livestock outside of that we can stockpile orchard grass most of our, our native what kind of orchard grass stuff that it's just grown in and orchard grass is really early mature in orchard grass and it will stockpile just fine. Um, we can stockpile things like reed canary, uh, timothy. Um, those are those are OK. They're not going to be as good as fescue and orchard grass, even down to the ryegrass and, and, and Kentucky bluegrass. Those will stockpile. They won't last as long. And so uh, in order of, of ability to last through the winter, stockpile tall fescue will last most of the winter, February or March, before it's of, of lower quality. Orchard grass will last into January for me most of the time. Um, rye grass, bluegrass, you're, you're going to be lucky to get a month or two into the winter time if that stockpile is really not going to be of much quality or quantity left out there in the field. But just about any grass forage can can be stockpiled and used at a later time. Uh, the legumes that we have are great companions to our stockpile. But they won't stockpile very well at all. Uh, I, I red clover stockpiles pretty good in a really thick stand of tall fescue because the tall fescue kind of sh shades it and keeps it protected. Uh, but a, a pure legume stand on its own won't stockpile very well. So we've got to have grasses to be able to stockpile. Um, then the question comes which pastures should be stockpiled? Well, if we had to pick the perfect pasture to stockpile, uh, we would want something that is uh, dry high and dry for the most part, well-drained, um, wouldn't want to use a creek bottom or anything like that, something that's going to lay wet. And then we would also prefer to have something that's east or south facing slope. Uh, that can't always happen in eastern Ohio. We've got slopes that face all four directions. So, you know, sometimes we have to pick and choose which is our best option. We stockpile grass at home on fields that are contoured. And so they have all four different directions in that same field and, and they work out OK for us as well. But one of the big things for me is I don't want wet natured soils in my stockpile grass. I want to graze those wet natured soils in the fall when they're dry anyway uh, and be able to stockpile the higher and drier soils um, for what later winter feed. And then if we're going to stockpile grass, we need to think about applying nitrogen. Uh, if if we don't have a good legume content out there in the field, if we haven't grazed those off recently so that that legume is re releasing some of that nitrogen out to our grasses, uh, we may think about a nitrogen application. And we've got questions here lately in the office about nitrogen. Um, I think we can get away with uh, uh, 50 pounds of actual N per acre out there uh, to be able to help us build stockpile. But there again, it, it's all in if it rains. In Eastern Ohio, we, we don't have a, a form of nitrogen that is readily available uh, that's not going to volatize in the heat. So we have to be able to put that nitrogen down before it rains um, so that it gets worked into the soil on its own in a pasture situation. So 
we may not get a chance to put nitrogen down. We may not know that we're going to have that 100% chance of rainfall in the next few weeks. I don't know whether it's coming or not. I sure hope it does. Uh, but if applying commercial fertilizer is, is a part of your program, we ought to think about putting down some nitrogen with that stockpiled tall fescue or stockpiled grass to be able to give it a boost and, and let it grow some more yield. And then the questions come in, how, how, do we, how exactly do we do it? So basically we stop grazing on a field and, and then we let that stockpile build. Um, we, we may do it in two different kind of ways though. I guess kind of the conventional way or thought has always been to uh, just leave those fields alone until that November 15th or the time of need popped up. Uh, I do have to say that a lot of times we've set fields aside to graze a stockpile later and then and got a dry period in October and November. And we've had to use that stockpile up before we ever really got to the, the end of the growing season. And that's okay. I mean, we're building stockpile to use it later. But how do we do it? We, we usually would just leave an area and, and let that stockpile build. Uh, kind of a new way that Greg Judy's kind of pioneer and there's some other guys that are talking about it is those guys are, are, are deciding, yeah, we're going to stockpile some grass, but we're going to rotate our animals through those fields. We're just not going to allow them to take very much forage on their passes through. So I think Greg has talked to his, his goal is kind of take two, maybe three inches of the forage off of each field as he goes by, but allow it to build a stockpile as they rotate the cows through. Kind of a new thought. I, I don't know how well it's going to work. I, I'm, we're going to try some of that at home this year. My concern is that they're going to take out a lot of the quality of the forage and, and leave behind some stuff that's of lower quality. But that's not always such a bad thing either. The natural kind of cycle of things is for, for animals to be eating lower quality type forages in the winter anyway. So that that can work for us and against us, I guess. But it's an interesting thought to be able to rotate through those and, and not take very much, leave some forage, leave a lot of forage behind uh, to be able to use as our stockpile later. And then the last question is, how do we meter that out? Um, for most for most of us, stockpiled grass has been metered out using strip grazing, uh, giving them a small area, either daily, every three days, or weekly, uh, allow them to graze that area down to two or three, maybe four inch height, and then moving on. Um, one of the newer kind of thoughts is to rotate through that stockpile uh, just in much the same way we would in the, the summer months. Um, I think. Judy and some other guys are, are starting to talk about, let's rotate through it twice in the winter. Let's take a little bit the first pass, take it all the rest of the pass, the, all the way down the next pass and allow the, the new forage then to grow up quickly. So that last pass will be close to the time in the spring when we would be growing new grass. Either way works. Um, I, 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 with the cattle, I graze our stockpile completely. The first time we only go through one time and that's it, we're done. With the sheep, I rotate through the stockpile two or three or four times in the winter because if you know anything about sheep, they like to see new ground. Uh, they like to see new grass. And if we would fence the sheep in tight and make them graze all of it at one time, they would, one, overgraze things a little bit because they would pick out the things that they like. And two, that's when you raise your chances with them getting out. So I like to just rotate them around. And, and yes, the quality is going down over over winter. It goes down anyway, but it's going down because they picked out the quality stuff. Uh, but it keeps the sheep in, keeps the sheep happy to be moving to new fields every day. Of course, we talked last time about planting winter annuals, and, and I don't want folks to overlook that, but that, that deadline's coming up, or that start time's coming up here pretty soon, too, of planting winter annuals. And so if that's something that you want to do, uh, you want to probably get your seed ordered and, and get your areas picked out, but you want to plant some winter annuals. I think winter annuals have, have a good place out there for fields that have been mowed for second cut and hay, maybe. Uh, for fields that have possibly been overgrazed, we maybe grazed them a little too hard. Uh, maybe if we've had to feed some hay and we have a kind of a sacrifice area, we need to plant some something in there anyway. Uh, winter annuals would work out good for that. I don't want to talk forever on winter annuals because we talked a little bit about that last week. But things like winter wheat, cereal rye, oats, hairy vetch, Austrian winter pea, 
uh, all those things are, are out there and, and would work great for, for a planted winter annual to be able to graze uh, through our winter time. And, and it, there again, it's something that we need to think about now. Um, thinking about it November 15th isn't going to do us any good because it's too late to get it planted and get it started. As we talked last week about feeding hay, we're going to talk a minute here again this week, um, only from a different sort of angle. I know there are some of you out there that are saying, well, it's fine to talk about stockpile grass or feeding winter annuals, but we're still going to have to feed some hay. And that's probably true. We're probably going to have to feed some hay. Although I think there's a lot of us that could get away with stockpiling a whole lot more forage or planting some winter annuals, or even planting some summer annuals to help us get more stockpile for the winter uh, and be able to get further through the winter and be more efficient and save us money in the long run. Uh, I think all of us could probably get a, a target for how much hay we, we can feed or we should feed for the winter and and maybe even have double that quantity at home. Uh, hay, hay stored away is gonna be okay for a year or two or three uh, and, and if we have that as insurance, that's perfectly okay. Uh, also, you know, this is the time to think about how are we going to feed out the hay that we have, whether we bought it or whether we bailed it. Are we going to unroll it? Are we going to space bale feed? Are we going to feed on a heavy use pad? All three are good options. I've done all three at home, do all three almost every winter. Uh, each have their merit, each have their problems too. So, this is probably the time to start thinking about how and where are we going to feed the eventual amount of hay that we're going to feed. It, it doesn't hurt to feed hay when we need to, as long as we've got a plan for how we're going to get it fed. And then um, just remember, you know, if we're going to consider feeding hay out in the field, uh, think about those low fertility areas, the places that need some rejuvenation, maybe the places that need some seed that's going to come out of those hay bales. Uh, to be able to get those pastures growing better than what they are today. My advice is for hay is just treat it like an insurance plan. Uh, I know I've said that before, but, you know, our goal at home is to eventually get to where we, we only need to feed 30 days worth of hay. And if we can graze through the entire winter, great. Uh, but uh, our plan is to kind of keep 30 days in our mind, we're going to feed hay for 30 days through snow or mud or frozen weather or whatever, but keep that supply of 30 days of hay. We're, are we there yet? No, we're not even close, but we're trying. And uh, even if we were only going to feed hay for 30 days, we would probably still keep a 60 day or a 90 day supply just in case we had a really bad winter. We haven't seen a winter like that in a long, long time, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to have one in the future. Well, that's a wrap for this week's. Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web presentation. When, as always, by thanking our sponsors and thanking all of you for your comments and questions and uh, good remarks on what we're doing here. I'll be looking for another presentation to come out next Thursday. See you next time.